Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Tuesday, May 31st, 2022. I am Dave Biddle. I'm very happy to be joined by Patrick Murphy. A lot to get into today. Let's start with this, Patrick. We had a uh, one of our loyal listeners on Twitter ask about this. Um, wanted to know, what is the team up to right now? When did summer workouts start and what are they up to right now? Well, summer workouts started a couple weeks ago. Mickey, Mickey Marotti's program started a couple weeks ago and then the guys had half of last week off for like an early holiday break and half of this week off. So they'll, they'll get back at it on Wednesday of this week. So that's what they're doing right now. Patrick, speak about that a little bit. And we got a chance to speak with Coach Mick a few weeks ago. Speak about maybe some of the things that stood out to you with the sports science stuff that he's doing and how he's kind of evolved as a strength coach and how last season is highly motivating these guys. Right. Well, first of all, in terms of the, the workouts they're able to do now, the, the summer workouts obviously different than, than anything in season or spring practice, but the NCAA is allowing coaches to now work with the guys, spend some of their eight hour work weeks in the film room. And, and Ryan Day said last week when he was on uh, 97 won the fan that they're even going to be able to do some on field stuff. So they'll be able to use what they saw in spring practice, some of that film, especially on the defensive side of the ball to work with some guys on things, which I think is going to be a big boost to continuing the, the evolution of, of things on the defensive side. And, you know, we'll be able to kind of see how that evolves throughout the course of the summer. Hopefully we'll be able to talk to some guys as the summer goes and, and see how having that availability um, with the coaching staff is, is different than other years and, and maybe making them better. As for Coach Marathi, it's always great to talk to him. We don't get to do it enough. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's just fun to talk to. And uh, the the thing that did stand out you touched on was, you know, he still brings up that Michigan game and, and kind of how that is, um, you know, motivating guys. And we heard that from guys all spring. But, you know, he even said going back to 2020 and the way that things were done um, because guys had to be so separate because he was, you know, used to being hands on with almost every player throughout the course of the day or at least seeing a guy throughout the course of the day because everything was so separated. They had workouts in the the weight room, workouts in the on the indoor field at the Woody, you know, everything's so spread out. Sometimes he would go a few days without even seeing a guy and, you know, guys that he normally sees every day. So he felt like that kind of changed some of their leadership stuff and, and really actually impacted the team more in 2021, where they had a younger group instead of the veteran group they had coming back in 2020, which I thought was pretty interesting. I think you probably saw some of that in retrospect on the field with how 2021 played out in some of those bigger games, especially on the defensive side of the ball. I don't think you had that leadership with so many young guys, uh, you know, kind of stepping into bigger roles. Um, but yeah, their sports science side of things is, is always evolving. I know there were some questions after they were kind of out physical in the loss to Michigan about whether Marathi needs to, you know, evolve further. And, you know, I think if there's anyone who's on top of that stuff, it's him. He's not going to completely change things just to change things. But I do think when, when something happens, um, that does kind of wake everyone up. We've heard the players mention that, coaches mention that, and Marathi as well. So I think that, you know, no one likes to see the Buckeyes lose to Michigan, obviously. And that loss certainly affected a lot of things. But, you know, maybe in a few years we look back at this one and be like, all right, that, that lit a fire under this program that maybe needed it a little bit. And we didn't quite see that at the time. Let me get a question from a viewer real quick. This is from Randy. He wants to know, when are the new freshmen coming to Columbus? Sometime mid-June. I don't have an exact date. I don't know if you have an exact date, Patrick, but sometime in mid-June, the rest of the freshmen, the ones that did not enroll early, so I think the other 10, I believe, um, will enroll sometime mid-June, so a couple weeks away. Yeah, that's that sounds right to me. Um, I was talking with Bill Curlick, obviously our recruiting guy recently, who does a great job, and plug for Bill. But, uh, you know, he mentioned guys getting in here early summer, um, actual summer, not summer workouts. So, yeah, that sounds right to me is, is they'll be here sooner rather than later. Um, you know, I, I think it has to be when when classes start. Right. They have to be enrolled in order to start working out is my understanding. So technically, I guess you could be on campus now if you wanted to, you know, come move early. But I don't think you can actually do anything with the team until you're officially a student. We have another question here. This is from Yakov. Do you guys ever get to watch summer workouts, assuming you want to? No, we do not. Um, we do want to. We do want to. Yeah, now, we, back we, in the day, they would one time a year – this is back when Steve Snap was the SID. Yeah, I've been on the beat a long time. One time a year during the Trestle era, they would let us in for the 6 a.m. workouts. 
That's called be careful what you wish for, my friends. Like, we kept, but can we watch the workouts? And Tress finally said, tell you what, media, you guys want to see a workout? Come to the WAC at 6 a.m. And then we did it once a year. And we're like, okay, maybe we shouldn't, like, ask to watch the workouts. They're going to have us come at 4 a.m. next time. So, um, so there you go. Jim Trussell, for those of you that don't know, has a very good sense of humor. Didn't always show it. Um, all right, here we go. So well, I, will, I will say with the summer workouts, in terms of us really gleaning much from that is difficult with what they can do. I mean, it's it's a lot of conditioning, lifting, those type of workouts, more so than actual football stuff. Now, as I mentioned earlier, they will be able to do some on-field work with the coaches. So there is some of that, <clears throat> excuse me now, but in terms of trying to, to learn a ton other than seeing what these guys are doing body-wise and whatnot, I don't know how much there is, but it would be nice to have some of that access, you know, talking to people I know that cover NFL when they get to do some of these rookie mini camps and things like that. There is some value in it, but it's different for, for college for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, all right, let's get into this. So another thing about Mickey Marotti, I did a story on this. <laughs> when we got a chance to speak with Coach Mick, I mean, he talked for like over a half hour, but he talked a lot. He talked about a wide breadth of things, but one of the things that stood out to me was He's really pushing C.J. Stroud to be at an ultimate leader. He thinks he's a good leader, but he's really pushing him. I think he mentioned 10 different times. I'm not exaggerating, Patrick. He wants him to be felt, heard, and seen. He kept saying that. I need C.J. to be felt, heard, and seen. Those are the three qualities that every great leader has, and you can't be a great leader unless you're great at all three of those aspects. So he kept saying it. He wants him to be felt, heard, and seen. What did you make of that? Well, I thought it was interesting that – Coach Marotti doesn't believe that, that you can be a lead by example guy. He thinks, like you said, Dave, you have to have all three of those to be a true leader. And you hear that lead by example term thrown around all the time. And, you know, I do think there's some value to that. But I thought that was interesting from a guy who's obviously been around a lot of good leaders and, and is one himself. And when it comes to CJ, I think that it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that 2020 season. Obviously, he's he's the backup quarterback. And even if that season is as normal as, as any other year, it's a difficult uh, way to be a backup quarterback and, and still develop into a leader of the team, especially with a guy like Justin Fields standing in your way. Um, but I think that, that the fact that he wasn't around his teammates probably was was a little bit of a, a stalling of, of that leadership development. And I think Mickey Marotti's had to push that a little bit. Now, from what we've seen, from the videos that they put out on, on social media and things of team in the huddle and stuff like that, I think CJ is, is certainly felt and heard um, with this team. I think Coach Marotti just knows, look, this is his offense completely now. He's the guy. There's no questions about that. So he needs to command this group. And I think he did towards the end of the season. I think especially in the Rose Bowl, you saw a lot of that. But, you know, I think with a guy like Coach Marotti, he keeps pushing that on a player. He's not going to let J or CJ Stroud, I almost said Justin Field, um, rest on any sort of loyals, whether that be his play, his development in, in, in any category. And leadership is certainly a huge part of that for the quarterback. So I did think it was interesting, and I'm, I'm glad you wrote about it, that how, how much that was a focus for Coach Marotti this year. And the, the Buckeyes need that all over. I mean, it's not just at the quarterback position. Ryan Day came out early in spring and said, and this happens every year, but especially this year, you need leaders to emerge. And, and that's going to be key. And I think Marathi is just pointing at one guy, but really talking about a lot of guys that need to step up. I know Eric wants us to get into a lot of Bengal discussion and Reds discussion. Okay, we'll talk Bengals, but not Reds. I'm kidding. He he just says, go Bucks, who day, go Red Legs. Only 95 days till the Buckeyes crush ND's dreams. This is coming from Eric via YouTube. He wants us to give a prediction on the score for the Notre Dame game. When I saw this pop up, I was thinking, I might go with like 45 to 24. I feel like the Buckeyes are going to handle Notre Dame. It's not going to be like a crazy blowout, but I think that they're going to win comfortably. I thought about it more. Here's the score I'm going to go with. 45 to 26. Ohio State. That was also the score the last time Notre Dame came to Ohio Stadium. So I'm going to go 45 26. A little ode to Terry Glenn, the late, great Terry Glenn. That little hitch he took. 1995 took it to the house like 83 yards i'm going 45 26 buckeyes what do you got patrick yeah that sounds about right to me um i haven't looked at notre dame a ton i have their spring game recorded that that i need to dive into at some point but it's still obviously as as was eric pointed out still 95 days away um yeah but i think the buckeyes that that margin somewhere in that scoreline is, is probably about where i would go at this point i think the offense is going to be too much and and from what I understand of how Notre Dame's spring practice went, their offense is still a work in progress. I think if you're going to, we'll, we'll see what Ohio State's defense is, but I think 
you're going to have to score to, to beat the Buckeyes. Even the teams that Ohio State played last year had to do that. And I think the defense will be improved. So, yeah, I think your score line is probably pretty close to where, I, where I'd end up right now. That'd be wild if it's the exact same score as 1995. <laughs> but I, uh, So we'll see about that. All right. Let's get into this. Um, overall thoughts on the offensive line. I'll, I'll, be, I'll give my quick thoughts and I'll turn the floor over to you. I, I like the starters. We talked about this on the show yeah. a few different times, but um, I know people want to know about the O-line. People are concerned. I like the five starters. Um, depth is a concern. Josh Fryer is the top backup, and he might not be back till like the end of camp. And then that really puts the beginning of his season in jeopardy because how rusty is he going to be? What if he has a setback? Ryan Day has said that's his biggest concern on the team is depth on the offensive line. But it's kind of a, you know, it's interesting because I'd much rather have like good starting five and concerns about depth than so-so starting five. But man, we got a, like a decent three deep. They're all kind of, you know, we got 15 guys that are good. But so I'd rather have it this way, but I am concerned about the depth. Yeah, you said what I was just thinking was at this point in the year, I'd rather have your starters ready to go and you can work on that depth, figure things out. You obviously hope the guys stay healthy. You can rotate guys in in some of those early games, especially after the Notre Dame game, and you know develop that than be trying to figure out, okay, who's starting at left tackle? Who's our starting center? I think the fact that they have that starting five group set is, is big. Um, now, you know, there's always going to be some area of concern that we're talking about throughout the summer, and, and so this one be, is the O-line depth. I do think once you know, they do get healthy, you mentioned – uh, that being an issue, that was certainly an issue during spring. Guys having to do double reps and things like that just for, for numbers. But once they do get healthy, get some of the freshmen in there, the, the body count will be higher. And I think that helps alleviate a little bit of the concern. Um, you know, you do have some other guys that, that can step in. And Enoch Viamahe was a guy we heard about a decent amount throughout uh, spring practice that could be another guy to kind of rotate in if they need to work on that depth. Um, some of the young guys, I think, too, are going to have to step up. You know, uh, uh, George Fitzpatrick, um, Carson Hinsman, even maybe some of the freshmen may have to play more than, than you normally would just because there's not that naturally built depth. Um, certainly a concern, but I think they are in an okay spot given you have that starting five and a good starting five. Let's, let's not over, uh, overanalyze things here. That's a, that's a starting five that most teams in the country would be really happy to have on an offensive line. The question to get to this is from Bucknuts88. Wants to know, over or under 1,400 rushing yards for Travion Henderson? You can go first, Pat. That's a big number, but it would not surprise me if Travion hit that. Uh, it's actually funny that, that this got brought up. There's a thread on our board talking about Mayan right now, and I like Mayan Williams a lot, but I know there's some people that think he needs to see a, a ton more snaps, and maybe he will. I think people are forgetting how good Travion Henderson is. Yes, he was just a freshman last year. And yes, there are things he needs to improve on. He knows that. He talked about it. Tony Alford talked about it. But this kid is a star. And, and as good as Mayan Williams is and will be, and, you know, Evan Pryor, throw him in the mix. You know, you, you've got a bell cow back, assuming he can stay healthy, uh, a t super talent. You know, he was the number one back coming out of high school for a reason. Didn't play high school his senior year or didn't play football his senior year of high school due to COVID stuff. And so last year was really his first year playing in two years. I think he's going to do great things this year. I do think they'll use some of these other running backs that I mentioned, but Travion Henderson is, is something special. 1,400 yards is a lot, but, you know, if he's, he's developed the way we think he has, he continues to work. I think it's definitely within his reach. When you and I met with Ryan Day last year, first of all, I, I, I tend to think those conversations should be off the record, but everybody else who met with them put everything out there. So I guess it wasn't off the record. What did he say when we asked about Travion Henderson? He goes, this guy is a home run hitter. He's a game breaker. And that was before last season. So, I mean, you could just tell. I mean, his eyes lit up when he was talking about Travion Henderson. You hit on it. He's going to be even better this year. He's motivated. That kid is a workout warrior. They just say they can't get him out of the weight room. I mean, he is just cut up. He looks like Patrick Murphy out there. He's just so cut up out there. Um, he might even be more cut than you are, Pat. Um, all right, here's uh, – I want to see – I'm going to hit this one as well. Um this is from David. Do either of you see anyone else starting at linebacker in the 4-2-5 other than Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg? I don't. And by the way, let me answer the question previously. I didn't even answer it. I think he'll go over 1,400 yards. Barely, but I think they're going to play 14 games this year. Hopefully, they'll play 15. I think he'll go over 1,400 yards. I mean, he was close last year. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of wealth to be shared on this team. I get it. That's why I'm not predicting he's going to have like 1,800 yards. But I think he'll go over 1,400 a little bit. All right. Next question. Do either of you see 
anybody other than Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg starting at linebacker when they're in the 4-2-5. I don't. I mean, I think the other guys are going to rotate in there, but I think those two will be the starters. And when they go with the third linebacker, that'll be Reed Carrico as, as that Sam. So that's my take on that. Um, Pat, do you have anything to say on that one? No, that was what I was going to point out was that Sam linebacker is the only thing that I could see changing the way the linebackers look, but those seem to be the, the starters that you mentioned. I want to get to one more topic that I wanted to bring up. Um, thoughts on the Buckeyes' defensive tackles. I've heard some people say that they're not really thrilled about the depth at D tackle. I kind of like it. I mean, so the top five are set. So you got five guys that are just set. You know, I think Tyleek Williams is the best of the group. And then in whatever order the next four, you got Teron Vincent, who I thought really came on in the Rose Bowl. Um, you know, you got Jerron Cage. You got Mike Hall, who Jim Knowles talked up big time. He's a redshirt freshman, a little undersized for a D tackle, 6'2", 292, but very quick, very powerful. I think he can be a disruptor. And then Ty Hamilton. So those are your top five. Ty Hamilton's a guy I think people forget about. Um, he's a junior, younger brother of, of Davon Hamilton. And then we'll see after that, rounding out the three D, maybe Jaden McKenzie, who's now a fourth year junior, maybe incoming freshman Hero Canoe. Those are seven guys right there. I mean. Obviously, it's not tremendous depth, but I like the top five, and I think either McKenzie or Canoe will round out the three deep. So I think they're going to have six or seven solid D tackles, Patrick. What do you think? I agree, and, and I like that there's experience in this room. You're not bringing in guys that haven't played a ton. Most of these guys have played a, a good amount, if not a lot, throughout their career. Now, you, I don't know if you have that dominant defensive tackle, that three technique, um, but Ohio State's figured out ways in the past to, to either develop that guy or work around that with, with the depth and, and whatnot that you just mentioned. So the fact that they have experience playing at that position, I think is important. Um, I think the defensive line in general is something we probably haven't talked about enough. And, and by we, I don't mean us at Bucknuts, just in general, I don't think it's come up as much as it has in other off seasons. And I think this group could step up a big time, you know, the whole defensive line could step up and take a lot of pressure off that, that secondary, that back end, make life easier as that part of the defense still adjusts to things. The defensive line has their coach back. Larry Johnson is the guy, the holdover from last year. So while there's changes in the defense in general, and that should affect the defensive line a little bit, there is a lot more continuity there. And I think big play from that front four in general could, uh, could help the rest of the defense, especially early on in the season as they're still working some things out. So I think that's a big, big thing for this group. And, you know, they, they could really set the tone for the defense early in the year. There's one more question I wanted to get to here. Um, this is again from Yakov um, asking, is 2022 going to be the last football season with divisions in the Big Ten? I don't know. I really don't know. I think maybe if they're going to move to divisions, maybe it would no divisions, maybe it'd be 2024. I kind of hope this is the last year. Do you have any thoughts on that, Patrick? Yeah, I don't know when they would make the move if they decide to do it. Um, you know, other conferences have, have already made. I think the Pac-12 is the one that has made an announcement, but I don't know what year, they're, when they're changing. Um, I know there's been reports about the ACC, but I haven't seen anything concrete on that. Not that I follow that very closely. Yeah, I mean, to me, it, it doesn't matter a ton. I think if you're Ohio State, you're still going to play Michigan at the end of every season. You're probably going to still play Penn State every year. Um, I know there's been talk about maybe a third team that everybody has locked in. So I think it'll be interesting if they do go away from it. I, I don't really have a preference either way. I mean, right now it's nice in terms of travel that most of the games are fairly close to Columbus and you're not having to travel across the Midwest all the time, uh, only a few games a year, if that. But, you know, I don't, I don't think that it's a, a big enough geographical space that it makes a huge difference. And, it would be fine with me to go to Madison more frequently. I think that's one of the best places to watch a college football game, at least in this region of the country. Um, you know, there's a few of them too. Nebraska is awesome. Obviously those teams coming to Columbus are, are always great. Iowa's uh, a fun, fun atmosphere. So yeah, I mean, I think it makes for a more interesting um, schedule. If you are, are, it's less locked in on who you're playing every year, but I don't have a preference either way. I think, you know, the Buckeyes have, have had it good in terms of their strength of schedule just being in the Big Ten East. and But I don't think it changes much because, like I said, I think you still play Penn State. I think you still play Michigan. Okay, let's hit this one as well. Um, X Chrome Sausage X is high on Evan Pryor. Says Evan Pryor has to be the second option by the end of the season or he hits the portal. Um, 
May, I mean, maybe he will be. I think it's going to be tough getting past Mayan Williams, though, and I like Evan Pryor a lot. Um, I think it's going to stay Travion Henderson, Mayan Williams, Evan Pryor, and I say that as someone who likes Evan Pryor's game a lot. We saw what he did in the spring game, and he was looking good at the other practices we were at um, You know, that were open to the media, especially the Student uh, Appreci Appreciation Day scrimmage. We got to see them go live, and he was looking good. Carried that over into the spring game. But, Patrick, I don't know, man. I don't know if he's going to be the second option. I, I think it's going to stay unless there's injuries. Travion, Mayan. And then Evan. Well, first of all, with the transfer portal, I mean, you never know what guys decide to do, but Evan Pryor told us this spring and I wrote about it, that he thought taking going to the transfer portal was taking the easy way out. That's th those were his words. So unless he changes his mind on that, I'm not sure he's looking to transfer anytime soon in terms of the pecking order. I think it sort of depends on what they want to do on any given play. Now they don't want to sub a running back in. So it's obvious to the defense that, Oh, Evan Pryor's coming in. They're going to throw the ball here to him, or they're going to look to throw to him. Um, I do think what makes it difficult is not the right word. Cause it's a good problem to have, but Travion Henderson can do a little bit of everything. You know, you mentioned home run hitter, but he can also catch the ball. He can run between the tackles. Now he can improve on some things, but it's not like you have two guys that, that don't catch the ball. And Evan Pryor is that clear guy who can, and mine Williams can catch the ball. We've seen that a little bit from him. So, you know, I think Evan Pryor's skill set would be better fit if there were this guy does this, this guy does this, this guy does this. Instead, you have guys that can kind of do a little bit of everything, and Evan Pryor is still developing in that way. I definitely think he sees the field. I think they figure out how to use all three of these guys. Um, you know, I think there'll be plenty of carries because I do think Ohio State's going to win a lot of games pretty comfortably, and Evan Pryor will get plenty of experience. But, yeah, I mean, I think pecking order-wise, if you're just going straight down the depth chart, you hit it, Dave. Travion Henderson, Mayan Williams, and Evan Pryor. And it's going to be up to Evan Pryor and, and Mayan Williams, frankly, too, to, to keep those spots. And I think maybe, you know, if Evan Pryor really makes a push in fall camp, maybe that window there becomes a little bit closer. Um, you know, like you said, he looked really good in spring practice, but so did Mayan. So, um, you know, again, good problem to have for the Buckeyes, for, for Tony Alford in that running back room. Last question here on the Bucknuts Morning 25. All right, here we go. This is from Tavarius on Facebook. He asked, do you think Sonny Styles can see reps at Leo? So for those that don't, I'm sure most of you watching and listening know what the Leo slash Jack position is. For those of you that don't know, it's a hybrid outside linebacker defensive end. So this year, Jack Sawyer is going to be the main guy there. And look for Caden Curry to be his backup, in my opinion. They haven't said that, but I – all signs are pointing to Caden Curry being the number two there. And both those guys are going to play traditional defensive end as well, Sawyer and Curry. I thought Curry looked great as a true freshman during the spring. Um, and so we'll see what happens there. Mitchell Melton was going to be probably the number two there, but he's out for the season with that unfortunate injury that happened in the spring game. Now, Sonny Styles eventually could grow into that. What they're saying right now is Sonny Styles is going to come in and be that, you know, compete at that boundary safety, that bandit safety. He's not going to start um, – Josh Proctor is going to be the starter there. Uh, Court Williams is going to be the backup there. I think Sonny Styles is going to come in as that third team guy right away as a true freshman that should be still in high school. So he's going to come in as a bandit safety, um, which is kind of like a hybrid outside linebacker, strong safety. So um, could he grow into that Leo? Yeah, I think he could, but it'll be a year or two down the line. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah, it's definitely a possibility. I do think growing is the key word there. You look at Sonny Styles in comparison to – you mentioned uh, Jack Sawyer, Caden Curry, size-wise, bulk-wise, he would have to put on some weight for sure to play that position. You know, he was playing a true safety spot most of the time in high school. And as you mentioned, he's going to be a, a freshman who should be a senior in high school next year. So I think next year will be a developmental year for Sonny, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, I think he gets in there, he gets to go to work, maybe he sees some reps, and they can really figure out what's best for him. It's it reminds me similarly of when Darren Lee came in. Obviously, he didn't enroll a year early or reclassify, but it took time for him to find that spot on the defense where he was going to play. Same with us, Sam Hubbard. You know, these guys are, are athletic freaks. They come in, they get in the weight room, they kind of find their fit in the defense. And I could see Sonny Styles operating in a similar role early on, and then eventually he finds a spot, and I think he's going to be very good. You know, you, you love to have those guys who can do a lot of different things for your defense, and then you figure out how best to use them. That's another uh, another positive for a defensive staff that is pretty creative from everything we understand. So, yeah, I think he'll he'll find his spot eventually. It may just not come as a true freshman. 
Great stuff from Patrick Murphy. Also, Patrick Murphy. I don't know what I just did to your name there. His, his name right. is Patrick Murphy um, or Pat Murphy. Not whatever I said the first time. Uh, great stuff from Patrick Murphy. Thank you to all the listeners and viewers out there. We appreciate you guys tuning in and for all the comments and questions. Um, thank you so much for making us a part of your day. I know you have a lot of options. If you like the show, like, subscribe, give us a five-star review. All that stuff really helps. Again, thanks to Patrick. Thanks to all of you. Hope everyone has a great day.